Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another wonderful episode of the Drachmods and Denarii podcast. As always, I'm your host, Sam, joined today by our special, wonderful co-hosts, Antoine and Zadie, or Adrian. How are you guys doing today? What's up? Yeah, doing good. You guys have yeah, a good doing weekend? Quite well. You guys have a good weekend? Yeah, it's been pretty good on my end. Uh, it's been a bit of a rough and stormy weekend for me but what better time to talk about coins right that's fair there's no better way to start a monday than looking at some beautiful ancient coins and today we've got a pretty cool topic we're reviewing the cng classical numismatic group triton sale so this is their once a year pretty much feature auction sale they save all their best coins for this date it'll be held live in new york city at the new york international coin show or coin convention that'll be january 10th or the 11th and actually, fun fact, I'm not going to be there for this live auction, but I'll be at that show the weekend of. They've got dealers going, having coins, so I think it'll be a fun chance to sort of network, meet some people I've talked to uh, before on the phone and online, and just kind of get to see the numismatic world at its best. Exciting. I'm happy for you. Good luck yeah, with that. thanks. And as always, if you guys have any things you want me to look for, I'll keep an eye out. Coin types and whatnot. But yeah, I say we go ahead and get started here. We're going to start this off with a bang. The first coin we have is Lot 39. This is a beautiful Sicily Antilla Tetradram. It is 26 millimeters, 16.81 grams. And as you can tell, this has got lovely style, well-cut dies. And it looks like at the description here, some of those dies are plated, even though the coin isn't. Uh, it seems to be that this might have some of the better end dies of the series. And then yeah, I know... so this is one of those nice, interesting Greek coins. Um, it's obviously, when you look at it, it's very Greek. The style is incredibly Greek. It's got Arethusa, which is surrounded by four dolphins, which is a Syracusan theme. Syracuse being like the Athens of the Western Greek world. Um, and then on the reverse, though, is where the differences start to crop up because it's a very Carthaginian design. It's the classic Carthaginian standing horse with a date palm in the background. And so it's that fusion of cultures. And I think even in the description for this lot, they've given it like a nice black border to set it apart. And they've said in the style of Eunatos, who was one of the um, more well-recognized engravers from Syracuse from a bit earlier, about 50 years before this. Um, so this is just one of those interesting ones where even though the Carthaginians, they were Punic culture, a bit different, and they were constantly at war with the Greeks, including Syracuse, especially Syracuse, over control of the island of Sicily. Um, they did employ Greek mercenaries quite often, and they clearly weren't averse to using Greek dye engravers and Greek motifs and styles in their coinage, um, with a bit of that fusion of their local Carthaginian design as well. So it's a bit of a mix of cultures on this, which is what I find interesting. Obviously, it's extremely beautiful, too. It's such a nice coin. Definitely. So that sort of, yeah, that sums it up for me. So I wonder, I mean, I know this series is pretty desirable overall, but they're not the most rare coins. So seeing this at a $10,000 estimate, is that due to the wonderful die engraving quality? Because I think the type in general does go for less than that amount. Uh, so that's a mix. Um, this portrait die is definitely nicer than average. It's very, very nice. But there are definitely other dies that come close and sell for quite a bit less. Uh, what really makes this one stand out, though, is the reverse design. Because usually you have just the um, the head, like from about midway down the neck and up of the horse. So it's just the horse's head that's usually showing up. And quite a few of these are minted a bit later, and they have the Alexander's Heracles motif. Whereas this one has the full standing horse with the date palm. So this type, as well as the even rarer type where there's a running horse, date palm, and a Nike crowning it, the horse, mm -hmm. those are those tend to carry quite a premium as a result. So yeah, it's yeah, this is probably going to go well past the estimate, I'd imagine. Yeah, it's interesting too with the crescent moon up top. You kind of see that still as a symbol for that region of the world. To see that this early on is pretty interesting too. Find it yeah, very, I'm actually uh, not too oh. sure. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, continue. I'm, I was going to go on a different uh, tangent here. Oh, I was just going to say with the crescent moon, it's actually interesting because I have no idea what's going on there. Um, I know the crescent moon is a symbol that crops up in Asia Minor, I think in Cilicia and Cappadocia especially, um, around this time period or a bit later. 
but yeah, it's interesting to see it here with Carthage. So I wonder if it has maybe a connection back to Phoenicia, where they're originally from, or if it's something else. But yeah, as you say, that symbol definitely does endure for different reasons in that part of the world still. I th I think uh, you're absolutely right on the on the money there, uh, Antoine. Um, the uh, the crescent moon, as I understand it, uh, did at this time serve as a as a standard for the uh, uh, Carthaginians. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a Phoenician thing that originally came from there, but um, um, I'm fairly certain, at least, that they that they prolifically used the um, crescent moon uh, symbol. Yeah, I think you're right, because I think there's an issue of the Roman Republic, right? Faustus Sulla, where they depict Tonnet with a crescent moon headdress. She has a crescent moon at the tip of her headdress. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> nah, it might be a bit beyond the scope yeah. of the podcast. It's Yeah, the type with um Jugurtha, Jugurtha and Sulla on the reverse. Oh, yes, I remember now. Yeah. Yes, there might be some connection Oops. there. Yeah, we wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, um, I was gonna. I was gonna say the um, the similarity to to Uenitos is is very interesting. Um, obviously, um, when you when you look at the decadrams, they were struck around 100 years before um, this coin was struck. Um, so obviously, some of those decadrams would have been in. Um, in the market still uh, being transacted. Uh, but what's interesting there is that the decadram dies were actually uh, stored away for some time between strikings. So for example, with both Kaimon and Uenitos, you see uh, examples with a lot of dye rust on them. So hypothetically, one, would, one could speculate here that uh, the, this particular engraver who, who made this die had access to the original Uenitos die uh, to copy that from, uh, which is, yeah, super interesting. Yeah, overall, it's a great example here. We've got some nice provenance too. Uh, I'm in the latter part a little bit suspicious, but you've at least got provenance of 2013 confirmed. But overall, a very nice coin. Nice toning too, if you zoom in here around the nose, especially on Arethusa. You can see it's got that lovely blue-red toning around the nose, around the chin, around the neck as well, and a little bit in the hair. But yeah, that is a lovely issue. And we can go ahead and move on to our next coin. And that will be CNG lot 384. Now this is a Jewish war half shekel from the Jerusalem Mint. It weighs in at 6.94 grams. It is 19 millimeters wide and it's from year two. And uh, Antoine, this is another coin that you picked. Maybe you can give us a little bit more of the background. Yeah, so the Jewish revolt, um, the coinage from it, there's the two big Jewish revolts of the first Jewish war here and then the Bar Kokhba revolt of the 130s. Um, the coins are fairly rare. They're pretty interesting. I don't think they get a whole lot of exposure, generally speaking, in the numismatic world. Um, but yeah, it's this interesting period where we have direct documentation from participants in it. You know, there's people like Vespasian and Titus, and then also Josephus on the other side, who are documenting this conflict as they live through it. So it's interesting in that sense, too. It's very different to the normal Greek world conflicts that you get, um, but that's because it's in the first century during Roman times. Um, these coins, I'm actually not too sure myself what silver these coins were made from. I do know with the later Bar Kokhba coins, a lot of them are made using denarii that were circulating in the region at the time. So you get these wonderful coins where it's like the face of Vespasian is still half visible as it's overstruck with like this camel's hoof or whatever other motif is on the coin um, and surrounded by a Hebrew legend. So you get these very fun coins there. Um, in terms of uh, this revolt, though, I do know that it was it ended up being quite brutal in the end. So I think it stemmed from religious differences within the Jewish community at the time that somehow manifested as political differences and the Romans got involved. Eventually, the whole province revolted and there was even a massacre of quite a few, I think somewhere around 80,000 people in Alexandria. Um, so just this big uprising across the region many legions had to be diverted. I think like four or five legions eventually had to be diverted to contain the uprising. 
and it took the better part of yeah four to five years which is relatively uncharacteristic for rome they're usually very quick to respond to these sort of internal stirrings Yeah, I forget um if it was the yeah first or second war, but you also had the legendary siege of Masada where you had, I think, a few hundred Jewish soldiers who held out in the fort of Masada for it was either a number of months or years, and in the end they committed mass suicide rather than surrender. So you've got an ancient tale of heroism to kind of sort of tie it into this series. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that's actually from the, I want to say that's from the Bar Kokhba revolt, the second one. Okay. But it's interesting because the tactic was definitely used in this war too. Josephus, the writer, who later goes on to live in Rome and give us the account of this war as well as other writings, he actually was the commander of, and I can't remember which fortress it was, but he was the commander of a fortress. And in the end, um, him and his companions, they drew lots to see who would... They didn't want to surrender, so they drew lots to see who would commit suicide. It was suicide by comrades, so they would one of them would draw a lot, and then whoever it was, they would get killed by their comrades until eventually there'd be nobody left, right? And I think in the end it was Josephus or Josephus and one of his close friends that ended up surviving that. Um, and they surrendered to the Romans and then went on to tell their story. But yeah, they definitely, that tactic definitely did exist at both, both revolts. What's interesting, too, is the existing arch still, where you can see reliefs of this incident. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here's a very famous scene, the Arch of Titus, where you see they have the Roman soldiers carrying the menorah and all sorts of artifacts or uh, items from the Holy of Holies, from the Jewish temple as spoils back to Rome. And yeah, this I'm pretty sure, wasn't this where the temple was utterly destroyed? I want to say it was rebuilt by the time the Second War happened, Second Revolt. But uh, yeah, like you mentioned, this devastation and conflict here it was... Uh, very brutal, especially I think the siege ended up lasting a couple of years at Jerusalem. So I think a lot of the Roman soldiers were fed up with that and then sort of took their anger out on the population who oftentimes had nothing to do with the siege. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. This was, um, I'm not too well versed on Jewish history, but I think this was the second um, destruction of the temple. So the first is under, I think, the Assyrians and the Babylonians helped to rebuild it, or rather the Neo-Babylonians. Yeah, Cyrus, And then right? this was the, yeah, uh, yes, either Cyrus or Nebuchadnezzar, yep. And then this was definitely under Titus, the second destruction, which I think, and I might not be right here, but I think certain Orthodox Jewish sects also believe that that's sort of the the expulsion point of the people of Israel from from their land, and that sort of marks this breaking point in Jewish history as well for them. So it's definitely definitely something that's had a lasting impact too. Yeah, what's interesting is, as well as the final result of where these items ended up, I mean, it has inspired pop culture like Indiana Jones trying to find the Ark of the Covenant and whatnot. But I believe most scholars nowadays think that the items ended up in, with the Vandals in North Africa. Uh, the Germanic tribe who ended up moving in that area, sacked Rome in the, I think, 450s was the date. I forget the exact um, year that it happened. But when they did that, they would have taken away all the treasures in Rome. And still at that time, they would have had the artifacts from this sack in 70 BC on display. So the sort of prevailing theory is those items got taken back to North Africa where they were presumably melted down or divvied up as spoils. Yeah, you're spot on. It was the 450s, the Vandals, and I think Procopius talks about how they took the treasures of Titus. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting coin that ties in lots of historical themes here. And I'm not too well versed on the prices here, but I know that the Jewish war coinage is pretty desirable sometimes and they can go for a lot more. I don't remember, but I want to say the actual full-size shekels can hit 35, 40,000, if not more. So I, I'm not well versed enough on this series to comment on the price, but it doesn't surprise me to see this already at 8,500. Yeah, I think somewhere in the 10 to 15 range is lower end. Um, I think the year also matters. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure year four or maybe year five towards the end of the revolt, those are quite rare and they tend to quite regularly go up into the mid to high five figures. That's right. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, overall, a great piece. And looking at the provenance, too, that's uh, pretty crazy to see. Almost 100 years old. We've got the Naval Sale 7 from the 23rd of June, 1924. So I think especially, too, that that might demand some premium on top of the normal prices here for this series. Oh, absolutely. This coin is going to continue just shooting past that estimate. Yeah, I'll be very curious to see what this goes for. But overall, a great coin, great history, too. I think you're right. If I had more money, this might be a series I would want to collect, but it's just so expensive that I think I could probably only afford the bronzes, if even that. But yeah, we can go ahead and move on. 
So next up, we've got a wonderful Daric from the Persian Achaemenid, hopefully I said that right, Achaemenid Empire from Darius I to Xerxes I, circa 504 to 480 BC. And then obviously that sort of lands in the famous Persian War era of history where you have the Greek states unite against the Persians and drive Xerxes back to Asia. But I think, Antoine, once again, this is one of the coins you shared. If you want to go more into the history behind that, it would be much appreciated. Alrighty, well, thank you. Um, yep, you're right. So this is from the Achaemenid Empire. And, yeah, this is from the period of the Persian Wars. So there's quite a few different variations of the Derek, which was the main um, circulating gold currency, but only in the, and this is maybe a bit of a misconception people have, it only really circulated in Asia Minor and perhaps into the Phoenician coast region. So it was very much localized to the western fringe of the empire where coinage was a big deal, that Mediterranean region. Um, whereas in Persia proper itself, and even Egypt, it was mostly done through a barter system and with bullion and foodstuffs used to trade. Um, but yeah, these were made in Sardis, which was the western capital for over 200 years almost, getting close to 200 years. And yeah, they really are just some amazing coins. But this type, this type 2, I believe it is? Yes, type 2. So. These are made right during the epoch of the Persian Wars. They have a slightly more archaic style to them. It's fairly distinct. And yeah, I just really love these because this is the currency that would have been directly used to fund the army that Darius and then Xerxes um, wrote, um, basically brought up to invade Greece and to reconquer the Ionian coast, that entire episode of history it would have been fueled by tens of thousands of these particular archers, um, which was another name for the, this currency, archers, because of the depiction of the Persian great king on so the obverse there. You mentioned the Type two being tied into that specific era of history. Does that command the premium here? I know I've seen some of the Dariks go for about $1,000, $2,000 as a price range, but they tend to be in the later era, like the 350s or a little bit before that. So is this sort of archaic early range part of why that's going for so much money? Do you think it could be influenced by that slab grade, even though I know everyone here doesn't agree with the slab system? Sometimes, sadly, they still do command large premiums for grades that don't really matter, but perhaps that's causing some influence here. Um, well, the type 3 and 4s are far, far more common than the type... The type 1s are very rare, and the type 2s are still quite rare. Um, 3 and 4 are definitely the coins where you can expect to get one in the 1,500-1,500 range in pretty nice shape. Um, these, especially as a Derek, not as a Siglos, which is the silver equivalent of around six grams, these tend to go for quite a bit of money. So I think even if there had been no slab, even if there had been no, you know, MS star, five out of five, five out of five grade, this coin would definitely be selling, it'd be estimated at least at like $10,000. It's very, very nice for the type, perfectly centered, fully there great details you've got the beard details still there you can see his quiver the flowing lines in his robe everything his shoes front and back it's all there the little um, turrets on his crown it's all very well preserved so yeah i think the grade honestly is deserved this is much nicer than average even though again i'm against slapping and i'm against slap grades like this but in this case this is one of the few cases where it really is deserved this is very, very nice. It is interesting. And I'd say the estimate is pretty fair. I was going to comment on that, seeing that it has no current bid. That is pretty interesting. I went through the Triton sale today, and I would guess maybe 75% of lots already had significant bidding activity on them. So to see this with no bid so far is somewhat surprising. Not to say that it's a bad estimate, but it is unusual to see no bids already at this point in the sale. I think it, Triton has been live for about a week, maybe two weeks now. But yeah, yeah, you are right. I think the 9,000 open is a little bit on the higher end as far as an opening bid goes. Um, but I think for a final hammer, 15 is probably reasonable. This this isn't really one of those coins that'll triple or quadruple the estimate. I mm -hmm. don't think it should, depending on who turns up to bid. But yeah, that's it's probably not heritage. part of the reason. It's not heritage. No. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> All right, well, we can go ahead and move on. This is a great coin, and I'll be curious to see what that sells for. 
And next up, we've got a coin from Adrian. This is from Macedon or Macedon, uh, the Roman province from Asilas, the Quaestor. It was struck circa 95 to 70 BC. It is an AR tetradram. It comes in weighing at 16.84 grams and it's 31 millimeters wide. So Adrian, if you want to take this one over and give us some background about this coin. Sure. No, uh, we've uh, we've finally arrived uh, at the uh, decadent um, Roman provincial section of uh, this year's Triton sale. Um, no, but as Sam said, this uh, this is a tetradrum of um, Isilas. Um, now, most people would ask, who who is Isilas? I've never heard of him. Well, <laughs> no one else has either. Uh, he uh, is an unknown figure uh, outside of his coins. He evidently served as uh, a quaestor in, in Macedon uh, during the um, uh, late first century uh, or early first century uh, BC. Um, he um, he is a an, an, an enigmatic figure. His coins were struck in a very very large emission, um, presumably to pay for Thracian mercenaries, but we we don't really know. Um, we don't really know either where they were struck. There are some theories that um, uh, Amphipolis was used, uh, a, a mint that had already been established at this time. Um, but as I said, we don't really know. Um, the the A proper attribution and a proper mint location has been hindered by the fact that uh, many of the hordes that have been found uh, have been dispersed uh, um, before any um, numismatic uh, uh, research could be done with them. Um, but it's certainly a very intriguing series, uh, and um, for an emission this large, to not know who the person who actually issued them, uh, who he was, is also very uh, uh, notable. Uh, the series as a whole um, has a few um, outliers, so mostly what you'll see in the market is the classic uh, deified head of Alexander on the obverse with a legend, uh, uh, Macedonon in, in Greek. Uh, on the reverse, you'll see uh, an array of Roman political items. Uh, so you'll see the uh, uh, kista, uh, you'll see the uh, uh, an, a curial chair, um, and the legend Isilas in the queue. Um, but there are a few outliers in, in, in the emission as a whole. Um, one issue in particular names a, another Roman official um, with the legend Kai and then PR. Um, it, it's postulated that this means um, Caesar Praetor, uh, and from there people have tried to, to uh, attribute that to, to a, a consul called Lucius Julius Caesar, who served in the um, early 70s uh, BC. Um, and um, it's really been uh, very hard to narrow down even when these coins were struck. Uh, I think, Sam, if you uh, minimize the picture here, the dating uh, on uh, that, that CNG uses is very uh, large. It isn't narrowed down at all. Um, and I think some authors even postulate that these coins were struck um, before 95. So, so 110 or 120 BC even. Um, this die, uh, this obverse die that's used on, on this coin, it's a very prolific die, but it's also very, very divergent in style. Um, I, j just before we hopped on the call here, I, I read um, uh, Boslaw, uh, the author of the main reference for these coins. Um, I read him um, describing the die as showing Alexander electrified, and I, I think that's correct. Uh, it almost looks like an imitation of what other Isilus coins uh, should look like. Um, but alas, even here we're we're we're, we're um, uh, we we found we we find another um, surprise in that this uh, obverse die is linked to. Um, other, uh, what you would call ordinary Isilis issues. Um, so definitely a very intriguing coin, uh, and definitely a, a, a very handsome, um, interesting depiction of Alexander on the obverse.
is there a reason for this high estimate? I know sometimes these can go for a lot less, maybe two to three hundred dollars, but this seems sort of high. Is that due to the nice state that this coin is in? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, these types of coins have recently had an uptick in the market. They used to go for 200, 300 in EF, uh, good VF condition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and seeing as they are so common, uh, there are literally thousands of these. Um, it's not that odd that they would go so cheap. But um, the, the last two years, especially 2020 and 2021, uh, the, the market for Isilis Tetradrams has uh, gone absolutely wild. And I think um, the estimate being presented here is probably on the conservative end. Uh, I think really? up to 1500 or even 2000 would be reasonable here. What's interesting, I don't know if this is a mistake or if I'm reading too much into this, but the chair on the reverse, does that have five legs? I see one spoke, two spoke, three, four, five. Seems to be maybe a, an error here in the engraving. I think it's an issue with the depth depth of perception that you're seeing. Okay. So on the on the leg uh, to the right, uh, mm -hmm. it's actually shown to be behind uh, the one that you're currently hovering over. Okay. So there, there I I can only see four legs. <laughs> Is this one continuous but, leg, sort of hidden by the table itself, or the? Yeah. This, so okay, so that the makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So the one you're hovering above now is the leg behind. So it's it's the one further away from us, mm -hmm. and the leg to the right of that is the one that's closer to us. Makes sense. So it is interesting uh, too. Also, another random point, but the reverse photo here is a little bit out of focus. You don't see that often for CNG. I noticed that during the conversation. It's a little bit fuzzy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I've actually noticed a few coins uh, from CNG's uh, photography department that's, that, that are like this. I don't know if they're rushed or, or, or something, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad my uh, the one coin I can sign is crisp HD photos. <laughs> I'd be a little bit upset if not. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, just interesting to note. But yeah, it's a great coin. Thanks so much for sharing that one. It's always interesting to see and learn more about Roman provincial coins. I feel like oftentimes they don't get enough attention, not enough love. So it's interesting to see that here. And next up, we've got another Roman provincial coin. Well, I'm not sure if this qualifies as provincial. Maybe it does. But it is uh, the Fleet Coinage of Mark Antony, a very famous series from an uncertain mint uh, with Mark Antony and Octavia on the obverse. And on the reverse, we've got a, I'm not sure what those animals, hippocamps, uh, a quadri, or a, yeah, a chariot pretty much of hippocamps. Quadrigitas, I'm not sure what exactly that would be called, but it was minted in the summer of 37 BC. It is an AE Cistertius at 27 millimeters and 12.22 grams. Um, yeah, uh, the, um, the these types of coins, uh, first looking at it, uh, would probably to, to, the, to the novice eye look very unremarkable, not very interesting to be honest. Um, if you look at the surface, it's been cleaned, it's been scratched. Uh, this is probably something that we can just uh, go right past and just scroll through the Greek coins instead. Uh, however, uh, often, as, as is often the case with Roman provincials, it hides a lot of very, very interesting details about um, the, uh, the late Roman Republic, uh, the civil war uh, between uh, um, Antony and Octavian, uh, and the future of the Roman monetary system going into the uh, imperial era. Um, so this coin was minted uh, for Mark Antony by one of his naval prefects. Uh, these coins are usually stylized as, as fleet coinage, and that, that is because they often feature um, themes uh, that are, are nautical in nature. Um, so, so th this coin having been struck uh, by one of his, uh, what you would call an admiral, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, is one of three different individuals who struck coins for Mark Anthony. Uh, this particular coin was struck by an individual called uh, Lucius Sempronius Atrat Atratinus. Um, he, uh, he was a um, pretty influential uh, Antonian uh, during the... Um, uh, during the late Roman Republic, uh, especially after uh, the uh, Liberator Civil War, he would eventually uh, defect to the side of Oct Octavian uh, and uh, uh, would go on. 
yeah, definitely. <laughs> and would then go on to serve as uh, as consul and uh, uh, even uh, hold a triumph uh, d uh, under the auspices of uh, Octavian, of course. Uh, these coins in particular, they belong to a series of very, very enigmatic uh, bronze issues. They were struck in, in what you would probably recognize as the later uh, imperial monetary standards. You have Sesterci, you have Asses, you have uh, uh, Semis. Um, so what, what scholars often look at here is a, a precursor to the universal Roman monetary system that would later be introduced by Octavian in um, uh, 19 uh, to 17 BC, somewhere around there. Um, so they are, they are a very interesting look into what Anthony attempted to do when it came to his monetary policies in the East and what Octavian eventually would do um, when it came to, to the Roman Empire um, after the Battle of Actium. Do we know why Mark Antony struck this series of coinage? I know it's a bit of an anomaly in this era, not only due to the weights and sizes of the coins, but also the designs. I would say, in a positive way, they're a little bit out there, they're innovative, they've got uh, pretty interesting designs you don't see elsewhere. Is there a reason why he would have chosen to do this and not stick to conventional coinage? Well, I think... Uh... At this time, Anthony was uh, consolidating his eastern um, gains in the in the in the Roman Empire. Um, so Anthony at this time was in control of the eastern parts, uh, the eastern provinces. Uh, and I think a long-term project at this time was to uh, coalesce and introduce a a Roman uh, monetary system upon the. Uh, historically Greek world. Um, I think this is something that uh, Julius Caesar, had he, had he been alive, he would probably attempt to do something similar. Um, because uh, you, uh, I, think, I think it's reasonable not to want uh, your, um, your provincial subjects to be transacting in coinages that you don't control actively. Um, so with these coins, I think Antony attempted to to control the um, the production of money, especially when it came to, came to to, to uh, smaller bronze uh, denominations, uh, and uh, he he wanted to 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 make that universal. He wanted not only for the um, uh, for the city of Rome to be. Um, transacting in, in, in produce from the Roman mint, but also the, um, the Eastern Roman provinces. Very interesting. And I know you recently picked up a fleet coin in a Nauman group lot. That was pretty exciting. Yes, absolutely. I, I've, um, I haven't really been, been collecting these actively just because they are often uh, quite worn. They're often very expensive. Um, but I, I had the, the opportunity quite recently to, to pick one up, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm super excited to start a journey of uh, collecting uh, fleet coinage. Now, Antoine, I know you also collect Roman Republican. Have you ever looked at the fleet coinage trying to collect this series? It's definitely an interesting series, and I think there's some very, very cool designs, some cool motifs, and some cool things monetarily going on there. Uh, but frankly, <laughs> they cost quite a bit, which at the moment, I've just considered the silver to be a better focus for myself at the moment. That's fair. How could you? I, I do very <laughs> much look forward to your journey, though. I think it's going to be an incredible collection. Yeah, same here. I think it's one of those sort of niche areas that I like to see collectors focus in on. I think I definitely, with a couple of years' patience, you can assemble a very nice collection that pretty much no one else would have. But yeah, we can go ahead and move on to our next lot here at Triton. This is another Roman provincial coin, this time from Asia Minor. It is uncertain who minted it, but it looks like it could be Octavian, around 30 BC. It is just an AE provincial coin. It looks to be a little bit under the weight of an ass at 6.83 grams and 19 millimeters. A very interesting issue that I'm sure Adrian would love to tell us more about. For sure. Um, well, you you uh, you um, were exactly right on the money there, Sam. Um, 
we don't know who issued this coin. Um, and I think um, CNG um, underscores that a bit with the, uh, <laughs> the, the question mark uh, after Octavian's name there. Um, this coin comes from a very enigmatic series of um, provincials struck uh, at the climax of uh, the late Republican era. Um, we don't know for sure where they were minted. Um, scholars previously have attributed this coin to a mint in Syria. There have been talks about other Eastern mints, um, but I think um, uh, it, it's been uh, analyzing find data. It's been uh, fairly um, made certain that these were struck in Asia Minor and more specifically in Cilicia. Um, and that obviously brings up the question, well, who's being depicted here? Uh, what does the reverse mean here? Um, uh, there are many questions surrounding this issue. Um, back in the 20th century, um, numismatics was kind of, uh, especially classical numismatics, was kind of young. And I think a lot of wild theories were propped around. Um, this coin was definitely affected by that. Some authors would, would suggest that the portrait here is of Brutus. Others would say, oh, well, it's no, it's, uh, it's Julius Caesar, obviously. Um, and others yeah, more recently would attribute it to uh, a, a fella called Gaius Sosius, a, um, uh, an Antonian uh, general um, who struck uh, a few coins for Mark Antony in this time period. I think that would be most interesting just in terms of the people you mentioned with either Brutus, Caesar. I mean, as interesting as those people are, we've already got tons of coins in their name with their depiction as well. So it'd be fun to get, so to speak, a brand new character unlocked with Gaius Socius. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would be all over that. Um, but unfortunately, it seems that an attribution to, to Gaius Socius at this time is a bit far-fetched. Um, more likely uh, is that this is a portrait of Octavian, uh, struck in the uh, late 30s to early 20s uh, BC. Um, we've been able to find other issues of a um, uh, very, very similar style from Cilicia, um, possibly even uh, engraved by the same cellator as, as seen here. Um, so, uh, um, the authors of uh, RPC, uh, Roman Provincial Coins, um, they provide a pretty um, solid case for this actually being um, Octavian based on stylistic uh, uh, determinations, but also upon the fine data of different hordes. And so what do you think of this estimate here? I know this series overall isn't that rare, but this seems to be exceptionally nice. Um, yeah, it's pretty nice for the issue. I think the estimate uh, is a bit ambitious. These do not really go for that much money. And when they do, it's often because um, the auction house props up these uh, older, uh, more dated theories about who's being depicted here. So for example, if an auction house chose to, to depict this as a, an issue of Gaius Socius, you could expect a larger hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think CNG is being very honest here in saying it's probably Octavian. Uh, and I think the estimate, while slightly ambitious, is probably um, more conservative than you would see on, in, on, in, on other uh, auction houses. I will say it's nice to have that previous Triton provenance as well. So if you buy this, you're almost guaranteed to be able to resell this in a future Triton sale. Yeah, I was actually debating uh, why this was included in a, in a Triton sale. Uh, frankly speaking, this is not really a Triton coin. Agreed. Um, but I think the, the consigner might have been able to, to barter a bit, uh, uh, having consigned other coins or maybe even mentioning, well, uh, oh, this was in Triton in two, 2002. Why shouldn't it be in Triton in 20, 20, 20, 2022? Like, yeah. Um, I could just like uh, close out um, these coins, uh, as you mentioned, Sam, uh, they're not very rare, um, but however, they were struck in three different denominations, uh, one of which is pretty rare. 
Um, so what you're going to see in the market is a lot of these coins uh, with the reverse showing uh, a, a fiscus, which is a basket for, for, for taxes, for coins. Uh, you'll see a, 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 a cella, um, which is a, um, a spear uh, shown to, to highlight Roman Imperium. Uh, and then a um, uh, Quaestoria, a chair which, in which the um, uh, Quaestor would sit on when collecting taxes or, um, or um, uh, judging uh, judicial cases or, or what have you. Um, so these are the coins that you often see in the market. However, there's a third denomination of a lower weight that depicts the, um, the forepart of a prow on the reverse instead of these uh, Roman artifacts. Uh, I actually just recently acquired one and they're, uh, they're pretty rare. So if you see one of those, pick it up. They're often very cheap. Hey, well, thank you so much for that wonderful in-depth background. That was a, a great overview of this coin type. And yeah, I'll be curious to see, I think maybe opening might see a bid at 300 USD. That still seems pretty fair, but I would be surprised to see it go all the way up to estimate. But yeah, overall, a very interesting coin. And thanks for including that. Next up, we've got some Byzantine I selected. So this is a very rare Solidus of Michael III, the Drunkard with Theodora and Thecla. And I just thought, number one, this stood out to me, just the um, iconography and design, most of all. Uh, it's unusual to see a empress depicted so prominently on a coin. You can see here that she, Theodora, is on the obverse. Uh, and quite clearly, she's being depicted as the one in charge. It harkens back to Irene. Many of you know Irene was an empress uh, about 50 years before this, who very famously ended up blinding and murdering her own son to hold on to power. And like Theodora, she first put herself on a coin obverse prominently, and then once she killed her son, she put herself on both sides of the coin. But unlike Irene, Theodora was actually a good mother and held the Regency Council for Michael. And once he came to age, she stepped down and let him take over in his own right. Uh, and Michael III actually kind of tying back to fleet coinage of all things, he is seen as maybe a later version of Mark Antony in the Byzantine Empire. So he is the last emperor of the, I forget the name of the dynasty. I want to say it's not the Macedonians. It might be the Macedonians, but the dynasty of Michael III is a part of. Amorian, sorry, he's an Amorian, the Amorian dynasty. Uh, he's the last member of that dynasty before the Macedonians took over. And when the Macedonians took over, Basil I actually murdered Michael. And so as a way to prop up their own regime and sort of put down the previous one because they wanted to explain away the murder, they sort of um, negatively disparaged Michael's character and labeled him many things like a partier and a drunkard. But interestingly, the Byzantine chroniclers, always aware of their history, decided to portray Michael as a new Mark Antony. So he was depicted in both the positive and negative qualities of Mark Antony. So he was shown as someone who was fearless, had lots of courage, someone who was well acquainted with the soldiers, someone who would sort of get down in the mud and do the dirty work, but also someone who loved to party too hard, who was irresponsible and just liked a good time overruling. So it's very interesting to see sort of those Roman Republican tropes playing out in Byzantium and also the cultural awareness of the Byzantines who were very much knowledgeable about their own Roman history and their own Roman past. And they sort of always brought that back up and used um, just very knowledgeable references to the past in their own era and times. And yeah, overall, it's a very rare coin, very interesting. And like I said, just to see an empress in such a prominent depiction is very unusual. You can tell the different design here, with especially the headdress uh, distinguishes the empress from Michael himself. But yeah, it's a very beautiful issue, very rare, and thus the estimate. You can see it's uh, estimated at $15,000, and the current bid is 9000 Honestly, I'm not too sure about what a fair price for this series is, but that seems pretty reasonable to me, especially considering it is a plate coin. Uh, but a wonderful example overall. Very interesting uh, about that. I, I had no idea about the uh, Antonian uh, connection. Um, is that something that's abundantly, like, is that clear from, from how the historians uh, uh, depict, that, depict him? Or is that yeah. something that has been postulated later on? No, I think they include some references to ancient historians and sort of drop hints here and there to paint that depiction. I don't think he's called overtly Mark Antony, but they drop sort of, uh, you can just say like loaded points, loaded sentences that point back to the ancient histories. And we're well aware that the Byzantines had the cultural knowledge of their Roman and Greek past. So it's something that sort of within that light makes sense to read the histories in that way. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah very sort of, cool coin. 
yeah, just sort of a transitional piece here between one dynasty and the next, sort of a, a breaking point. And even though the transition from the Amorians to Macedonians, that dynasty switch wasn't as dramatic as the fall of the Republic to uh, from Antony and Octavian to Octavian and Augustus alone. Still a very interesting transitional piece in Byzantine history, a great coin. I'll be curious to see what it sells for. I'm not sure if you guys have any last comments. If not, we can go ahead and move on. Well, I mean, uh, what do you think about the um, the price? Do you think it, it'll reach estimate or even Definitely. go above? Yeah, I mean, these sort of mid-Byzantine coins that are gold and very rare, they're difficult to estimate the price on. Usually there aren't very many examples, and they sort of range ballpark, I'd guess, maybe ten to 20000 sometimes a bit more. But considering this, the amazing strike, the little to nowhere on the coin, and the fact that it's a plate, honestly, I could see that going for MP5 to 10 above the estimate. Oh, wow. Yeah. Out of curiosity, do you know what the, the market for these, like who's buying these, what the drivers are? Because, I mean, you get a sense with a lot of Roman Republican, for example, or Imperatorial, it's the history that drives it, right? People want something made by Julius Caesar and Brutus and Mark Antony. And with a lot of the Greek types, it's either the history for like Peloponnesian War or Persian Wars, or then it's the artistry from, you know, obscure city that has amazing artistry. Mm -hmm. But what's the drive with these? Is it more history? Is it art? Is there some religious aspect? It's not maybe with this one, but with other ones yeah. that have more iconographic depictions? Uh, I mean, like, I, what wish, drives the market? I wish I could say history. I think that Byzantine history is the best overall. It gets no love, but there's so many amazing stories. There's more Byzantine primary sources than probably Greek and Roman put together. And pretty much any ancient history historical source was saved, preserved by the Byzantines. They were a culture who loved their own history and studying the past. But a lot of times, I would say collectors get started sort of through the easy entry point. So many collectors would look at maybe the age of Justinian and they see a gold solidus for $400. They see a tremissus for $150. And they sort of get their first ancient gold coin as a Byzantine piece. And then a lot of those collectors continue on the path. Oh, if I have Justinian, now I need uh, Justin. If I have Justin, now I need Maurice. If I have Maurice, I need Heraculus, so on and so on. And they sort of dive down that rabbit hole of the 6th century gold being a very easy and cheap starting point. And sort of once you're in there, sometimes people kind of get drawn to the Byzantine side and just end up going down that path naturally. Uh, and then like you mentioned, the sort of Christian iconography is also appealing to some collectors. Now, this one is actually a rare issue where you don't have uh, Christ or a saint or Mary on the coin. Uh, but a lot of times that'll be a big draw, like a biblical collector or a Christian collector will want to have one coin of Christ in their collection or one coin of Mary, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's kind of a mixture of some people get drawn to the history, some people get drawn uh, just through, through the cheap entry points and later on get kind of hooked down the road. Sometimes it's Christian iconography. And then also I think there's a big Eastern European market. I don't know how much in the high end they are, but there are a lot of Greeks today that do sort of celebrate their Byzantine heritage. You've got a lot of Russians, actually, Ukrainians, people in the Baltic states that do appreciate the Byzantine culture. So you've got a lot of wealthy people in those areas who also collect. That makes sense. Very cool. And yeah, you made a really good point, I think, about that historical connection and the parallels to Mark Antony, because you see that quite a bit with Byzantine authors. They'll refer back to these famous Greek and Roman works all the time. Yeah, which makes it fun, too. If you're well read, you can pick up on little hints here and there. But yeah, it's a really cool coin, uh, and I'm glad to see CNG has it. Very nice, and being a plate coin like this, I'm not sure how long it'll be till it, another example comes to market. But I wouldn't be surprised if this gets locked away in a collection somewhere for the next couple decades. So next up, I kind of chose a coin in the similar vein of being in the sort of ninth to tenth century, being very rare gold. There's some common gold throughout the era, but this is one of those types that doesn't come up very often. It is of Emperor Leo VI, the Wise. He's a very famous Byzantine emperor. He sort of bucked the trend of the past 300 years or so. Pretty much every emperor marched out to war at the head of his troops. They were very much barrack emperors. They would go out and fight. They would campaign against the Arabs, against the Bulgars, against sort of traditional Byzantine foes in that sense. But Leo stopped that trend. He was the first emperor in a long time to just stay in his capital. He's very famous for writing his own poetry, writing his own works. He wrote his own sermons. He is, uh, in some ways, maybe the first truly learned Byzantine emperor that came along. Um, besides maybe Justinian, you could have to, you can go back a couple hundred years to find different examples, but he sort of 
defines the century that he lived in by sort of being um, someone who focused on the culture and sort of arts of Byzantium over the military campaigns. That's not to say he didn't go in the offensive and didn't engage with other states, both diplomatically and militarily, but he sort of decided to emphasize learning and culture over military. And this is a very rare coin of his. His gold is pretty rare. And then especially this sort of single solo bus type you don't see very often. Uh, I'm not sure. The estimate does seem a little high. I would have assumed this would go for about maybe ten to fifteen thousand dollars normally. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes unsold or sells at opening for fifteen thousand. But it's a very nice issue. You can see the artistry is very good. You've got the Virgin Mary on the obverse and then Leo in the reverse. Yeah, that is one seriously nice coin. And I don't know if it's the design or if it's the clipping. It might be the clipping, but the lack of like a a ring around the edge gives it a very metallic feel. Yeah. Doesn't feel like a coin oh, anymore. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's very interesting. Leo also, I think the number of gold medallions we have, some of them are from his reign. He also has a number of impressive seals. So he's sort of, his iconography on coins stands out in that way. It almost has a very sort of pre-modern feel to it, where you could almost imagine seeing this in the 17 or 1800s from France or England. Absolutely. If you told me it was a medieval medal, I would have believed you. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you actually see any traces of clipping on this? I, I'm, I'm not sure if it, I can tell. It's the weight. CNG doesn't mention oh. it, but being at 4.31 grams, it's probably about 0. 0.10 grams below weight. But the Byzantines were very meticulous. No coin left the mint being even, I'd say, 0. <laughs> 0.3 grams off weight. So a lot of auction houses try to sort of quote unquote put that under the table. They attribute it to wear or whatnot, but. They were very precise. Uh, I mean, the solidus was the sort of, so to speak, dollar of the Middle Ages, and the Byzantines were very, very particular about the weight. Uh, and they had extreme quality control, if not throughout the dyes. Oftentimes, the coin leaving the mint didn't look very good, but it was always 100% on weight, on target. And purity as well. I mean, the purity remained remarkable for almost a thousand years, pretty much 0.99 gold. I guess you raise a very important point there. The artistry and the way it looks matters to us, but back in the day, it really didn't matter at all what it yeah. looked like, as long as it was real and it was up to the standard you expected. And this is um, something I'm not completely sure of, but I do wonder with Leo sort of being the artist emperor, if he put a larger emphasis and focus on numismatic iconography and making sure that looked better on his coins and predecessors, because you do see a noticeable increase in artistry pretty much just for his reign, both before and after the quality drops off. But during his 20 or so years on the throne, you really do notice sort of a, a zenith in artistry during this period. As a complete outsider, I feel like um, a lot of Byzantine coins aren't very individualistic. And I think that's probably something to do with uh, Christian art not being very uh catered to the individual more more so to the uh to the idea uh, but this seems like a very very individual portrait of of uh, leo the sixth agreed and i would almost say in some ways it is a christian aspect but it's also the byzantine state that focused on emphasizing the office over the individual you actually don't see dynasties established in byzantium like you do in the roman republic or the roman empire you don't have the julio claudians you don't have the flavians i mean there's the dynasties don't really exist in this period. It's very much an individual office, and people often wonder um, how could the emperor be God's vice regent on earth and then be murdered every 10 years, be overthrown every 15 years. There's sort of a, a disconnect there between the juxt juxtaposing the actual propaganda behind the office and the office itself, and sort of reading the primary sources, you quickly learn that even though the emperors like to say that they were God's vice, vice regent on earth, that's not the actual way it played out, and that the Byzantines had. A high level of allegiance to the office but not the individual it was almost seen as an elected post and if the emperor was not pleasing to the people they would have no qualms about overthrowing him killing him taking out his family etc it was always about what is the emperor doing for the people and if he's not doing a great job he'd be taken out so the numismatics in some way reflect that in that there's no almost no um sort of focus on the individual on the coins it's very much just the office of emperor shown again and again and again so if you were to Photoshop the bust of Justinian and Justin, you couldn't tell the difference. Maurice and Justinian, you couldn't see a difference. Um, same goes here. Michael II or Michael III on a coin, it would be very difficult without legends to know who is who, and that's intentional. The idea is that 
even though the man in the office comes and goes, the office itself is very continuous and stays in existence uh, without change. And that's very much reflected in their history in that the office of emperor has lasted or ends up lasting about 1,500 years in Byzantium. And there's very much a focus on the office and institution itself being sacred, but the man behind that um, is disposable, so to speak. He's merely a man. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just overall a really great coin, especially the bust of the emperor here. I like the way you can see his ears too and the hair, just uh, a great attention to detail. Even though you can still tell the Byzantine style of the elongated nose, the sort of pointy triangle face, I think it's still... It's a beautiful coin nonetheless, and sort of just goes to show that the Byzantines, if they wanted to, they could have had very nice coins. They just chose to emphasize other aspects. But yeah, a great piece. Also interesting that the Byzantines would have rocked long hair and a long beard. Sometimes you sort of picture, especially the Roman emperor being clean sh shaven, trimmed. Yeah, except like sure. up to Marcus Aurelius, but yeah, here you see what might go as a hippie nowadays. Well, cool. Last but last, last but not least, I've got a very interesting coin of the last Roman emperor ever, Constantine the Eleventh, Paleologos Dragatsis. This was struck in the year fourteen forty-eight. It is an A.R. Stavraton. It weighs six point five four grams and comes in at twenty-one point five millimeters. And of course, Constantine the Eleventh is very famous for being the last Roman emperor, the man who went down with Constantinople, who would rather die than surrender. Uh, and there's actually two series of coins. Um, that he struck there are wedding ceremonial coinages and siege coinages and they're distinguished by style and i noticed cng didn't mention which one this is i'm going to assume it's a wedding coin surprisingly enough this is on the nicer end of style looking at christ too uh the attention to care given here is not seen on the second series and typically the wedding coinage gets a lower hammer than the siege coinage just because obviously the siege coinage was struck in 1453 during the month or so that the constantinople was under attack and has that historical connection of being paid two soldiers fighting the defense in the city. Whereas the wedding coinage is just a bit less connected to that, but still commands a premium. And this is a plate coin in the study from Simon Bendall, recently passed away. But he discovered, not discovered, but he pretty much analyzed a large hoard of these coins and was able to systematically identify them and lay out um, a reference work for it. But yeah, it's a very interesting coin. You don't see it very often especially being a plate coin in that study. So these coins are, are famous enough that I've actually <laughs> taken time to, to read a little about them. And I'm always so perplexed that I'm never able to interpret the legends on them without mm -hmm. reading the description. I cannot see a single letter on this. I'm sorry. Well, so how some of that works is also die studies where one example has perfect lettering and then you can match the bust if it's the exact same one from being on that same die so this is probably later in the series but some of the earlier examples would have a full legend and really what's key here if you look at the legend the much more common john the eighth stavratons are pretty much identical in legend but with the first word so the johns would have um i w for um john at the beginning and it says the k w so that's kind of how you can tell the difference Gotcha. So if you ever are, see, are it, is there a common issue between like uh, auction houses misattributing uh, John uh, no. Savatrons to? No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're so rare; it's probably never going to happen. And most auction houses, I don't think I've ever seen one misidentified that's a John that was sold as a Constantine. It's usually they're kind of in that high enough price range to where it's given enough attention to detail to check. Yeah. Sure. 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 And and you would imagine that someone at CNG has probably die matched this to a coin with legible legends. Definitely. Well, that's what Simon Bendall did in his study. So I'm assuming oh, that yeah. I don't have the study on hand, but presuming this is that exact same coin and that work was already done by, I would say probably the premier Byzantine numismatist for the last 50 years. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. But yeah, honestly, I've got no idea what this will sell for. I mean, sometimes they go up as high as $50,000, but this sort of being a plate coin as well, I wonder if that even adds another premium on top of that. Yeah, overall, it's a very interesting coin. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably uh, one of the most significant um, Byzantine coins for someone that doesn't specialize in, in Byzantine coins to, to acquire. I think a coin like this probably um, 
uh, is uh, something that that a Roman collector would probably uh, think about buying. Definitely uh, a high-end Roman collector that is. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of see a lot of that. People just want to have the black bar header, last Roman coin ever made. So they'll yeah, yeah. the oil tycoon will spend a lot of money on that to make sure they own an example. <laughs> So it's a little bit sad for the Byzantine numismatists, but you can get the one eighth fractional for a lot less. Uh, I think those, if you're patient, you can get one for about two to three thousand dollars, which is still a heavy sum, but not outside the realm of feasibility. So cheap. Yeah. Three thousand dollars. Wow. Are, are <laughs> <Only>. those? Are <laughs> so those little. siege? Yeah, exactly. Are those siege coins or are yeah, they? Yeah, uh, uh, both. Yeah. So they, yeah, they've got two different styles. One that's sort of this is the nicer style, quote unquote, and there's one that's a lot more crude if you can believe it. Uh, and sort of, even though we're not told, the theory is that there was some struck at his coronation in 1448, and that's the nicer coinage, and then the more crude coinage was struck, struck during the siege. But honestly, there's no real evidence for that, so I'm not sure if that holds up to scrutiny, but it would be nice to think. And I'm pretty sure the primary sources mentioned them striking coins during the siege. Is there any breakdown on how common either of the types are? Or is it just sort of a up in the air kind of thing i want to say there's maybe i looked it up a while back maybe like 10 of the full stevratons on ac search sold in the last 10 years and maybe about the same of the one eighth fractional i don't know how much of the hoard that simon bendall studied was dispersed on the market obviously some of them ended up coming for sale like this coin i think a lot went to museums too so i'm not sure but they're pretty rare enough to where i would imagine you don't see one every year yeah that's Ten isn't ten of each isn't too bad, but certainly not common. And I, I wonder have one final point with yeah. um with the horde, is that all above board? How does this work? Because obviously there's issues with hordes that are undocumented and looting and illegal export. But where was this horde found? Like, what are the circumstances around? Because I imagine it would I wanna... have to be above board for CNG to publish that yeah. it was. I want to say coin. it was Istanbul, but interestingly enough, there's one more coin that's also ex hoard from Greece, which I know is a lot more strict. And I want to say the Greece export import laws came into being in 1965 or 75, the MOU. If you look at this coin here, it's got um, hoard publication from the uh, paper that came out in 1975. So I'm pretty sure that's post the export laws of Greece. So honestly, I'm not sure the legality of that, but it must be legal due to them publishing it. Yeah, so you'd not, imagine not they wouldn't want to say yeah. that it's, <laughs> it's pulled out of the country after it's illegal to export. But yeah, it's was, just interesting because I, I always was, thought it was the 1970 date for UNESCO. Yeah, th this is a coin I'm watching, and I was curious about that, but I've got to investigate the legality before I bid. But it's a very interesting piece, and once again, sort of being a part of a documented hoard is actually pretty neat, presuming it's legal to own that would be awesome to have. Oh yeah, well, yeah. good luck in that case. And I was gonna, it is. I yeah. assume it is. I was going to bring up one more coin. I wonder if we're not going to see the same bidder win two large pieces at this auction. So we've got the very well-known Romulus Augustulus coin for sale here. This is a quote-unquote last Roman emperor from the west, and you've got Constantine the Eleventh, the last Roman emperor from the east. So someone could win both of these coins and have a bookend collection of the maybe two most famous emperors that did little to nothing. Yep. <laughs> Elon <laughs> Musk. You out there? You watching? Yeah. Or any other uh, billionaire or millionaire for that matter. Mr. Bezos, if you're watching, if you like How our videos, give us a cut back. That, how scary isn't it that um, almost any like semi-rich individual could uh, corner the entire market here? Yeah. Yeah, this is like annual budget or more than, and <laughs> it's just a drop in the bucket on the other end. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been a good review. I hope everyone enjoyed this. Like we mentioned at the beginning, this is a review of C&G's Triton sale. This is their feature auction. It happens once a year in New York City at the New York International Coin Convention. This will be held live in New York and also streamed online January 10th through 11th. And maybe we can do a live stream during that. That would be fun just to sort of cover the sale and talk about the hammers live as it happens. But anyone who wants to drop $20,000 or more on this coin, you've got 28 days, 22 hours, and 26 minutes left. As always, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment to our YouTube channel. I'd like to thank our hosts, co-hosts, Adrian and Antoine, for coming on. I'm Sam. We appreciate everyone who takes the time to watch our videos. We hope this was educational and enjoyable. Thanks so much, and I hope everyone has a great week.